Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by HipChat. Bring your team to life with persistent team chat, file sharing, and integrations with the software you use, a team communication tool built for business. HipChat is free forever, and HipChat Plus, including video and screen sharing, is free for six months for the first 1,000 listeners at hipchat.com slash twist. And by Moo, an online print and design company that helps you stand out and make a lasting first impression. Stand out like an IPO-bound idea at a hackathon with premium business cards from Moo.com. Moo creates premium quality, customizable business cards and promotional materials. The range of high quality cards, top-notch paper, and exclusive design templates make it easy to create a business card as memorable as you. For extra wow, try Printfinity, giving you the option to print a different image on every card. Stand out with Moo.com. Hey, everybody. A very special episode of This Week in Startups today. I have the founder of The Last Mile on. His name is Chris Redlitz, and it's a very special program uh, that Chris runs. He's basically teaching inmates in San Quentin, up here in Northern California, how to be entrepreneurs and how to code HTML. Now, before you immediately dismiss this, remember, we've got millions of people incarcerated in America, many of them on nonviolent drug offenses, and some of them on violent drug offenses and all kinds of things, but we have a very punitive uh, system. And today we're going to hear about that system, not only from Chris, but from one of his graduates. And his graduate is one of the most well-spoken, um, driven, and well-balanced, um, really joyful uh, people that I've had on the program in, in six years of doing this. This is probably one of the most powerful episodes of This Week in Startups we've ever done, and it certainly was one of my favorites. Uh, stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. This is the show where we talk about startups, entrepreneurship, foundership, making stuff in the world that matters. And we like to talk about big issues here, too. We've talked about everything from genetics to energy to food and a growing population. One of the growing populations in the United States is those uh, people who are incarcerated. We had about a quarter million people, a half million people incarcerated in America up until sometime in the 70s or 80s. And then somehow, I think during the Reagan era, and I'm not an expert on all this, we decided we'd start to put millions of people in jail. And it's truly heartbreaking that many of these people are in jail for laws that don't even exist today, such as marijuana and things that all of us have probably done in our lifetime. And this great tragedy is particularly hard for us to deal with as a society because criminals, people who have broken the law, don't get any sympathy from anybody. People just don't want to take on that cause. Well, today on the program, Chris Redlitz is with me. He is a person who is a venture capitalist, an investor, independently wealthy, doesn't have to take on this cause, and he has. And he runs something called The Last Mile, and he's going to tell us about it today. But before we do, I'm just going to play a little video about The Last Mile and the tragedy that is the incarceration of Americans. inside the least likely place on earth, San Quentin Prison. We don't have computers here, much less access to the internet, but we're learning to be entrepreneurs and founding our own companies through a program called The Last Mile. In San Quentin Prison, there can be no access to the internet. Not only that, a lot of these inmates have been incarcerated for 10, 20 or more years and have never seen the internet. San Quentin is a pretty surreal place. It's out of a movie that's not like a modern institution in any way, shape, or form. There's such a fear around giving inmates access to technology that has really caused the system to totally stagnate. There are a lot of people in the prison system that have an entrepreneurial spirit, but they just use it in the wrong way. (laughs) 
Over the course of six months, we each come up with a tech business idea and create a business plan. For our final projects, we present our companies in front of a live audience. Most of us have never done anything like this before. This event is called Demo Day. We start prepping for Demo Day three months out. We're going to do our pitches. There's a diverse group here that are all successful Silicon Valley folks. They're going to give you some feedback. These are all passion projects for you, right? So really start to take it from here to here as you're presenting. All right. When I got to prison and I was like, what are you going to do? You committed voluntary manslaughter. You shot and killed someone. No one's going to hire you. All right. So I knew that I'd had to become so employed. So uh, the person you saw at the end of the video is Chris Redlitz, who is... Uh, with a uh, venture firm called Transmedia Capital, um, where he's been since 2008. When did you start The Last Mile, and why? We started in 2010, and uh, it was one of those sort of serendipitous moments. I was actually having coffee with someone who was doing mentoring for some of the guys inside San Quentin. And at the time, I lived in, San, in, um, in Marin, and I had driven by the prison a thousand times and never really thought twice about it. Um, but I was intrigued by what she was doing, and she said, well, why don't you just come in and, and see what's going on? So it was really out of curiosity that I went inside. And about a month later, they invited me back to do a, a talk on entrepreneurship. And I sort of reluctantly accepted, um, not really thinking that they would understand what I was talking about. But I went and I did the talk, and it was the most engaged audience I'd ever sp spoken to. It was about 70 guys. I was supposed to talk for about 30 minutes. I ended up speaking to them. Really, it turns into a discussion for about two and a half hours. And I left just completely blown away with the questions, the attitudes. The guys were handing me business plans. It was like they had this thirst for knowledge. It was just waiting there for someone to talk to. So that's what really was the impetus for starting the program. And you had never been involved in this issue of people being incarcerated or anything and just happened to stumble upon it. I'd never been in prison, yeah. never been in a prison, didn't huh. know anybody in prison, and uh, I was never really that inclined to do anything socially responsible, to be honest with you. You were just a marauding venture capitalist. I was. <laughs> I, I, I kid. Living up to the uh, reputation, right? It is like, uh, you know, people look at what we do as investors. I'm an angel investor. You're a venture capitalist. Yeah. And just say like, wow, you know, you're just facilitating the, you know, great accumulation of wealth. Yeah. Um, was it in some way you felt a little guilty about how well you've done and you just like felt like, gosh, I got to give back something before I go? You know, not really. It was just one of those things where you know it from yeah. investing. Yeah. You see something and it just sparks you. It's like, ah, holy cow. So I literally left prison that night. I was driving home thinking we were running the accelerator at the time. I'm like, we could do an accelerator in prison. What a great idea. Most people, by the way, Chris, would hear that idea and say <laughs> that is a Saturday Night Live skit or like some kind of like joke, like a funny or die skit. You, did you get laughed at when you told this to people, I want to start an accelerator inside of San Quentin prison? Well, before I got there, I actually walked in the house and Beverly, who's my, been my business partner also for the last 18 years, I said, I've got this great idea. And she said, no effing way am I spending time in prison. And right. she handed me a glass of wine and said, drink and ye shall forget. Right. Right. So she was adamantly opposed. Fast forward. Now she's the executive director of, of TLM. Wow. Yeah. So, so she and I actually did most of the sessions for the first year, just the two of us. Mm. Uh, and we felt like, you know, that was the most important thing to do uh, to really get the guy's trust. But to your other point, um, you know, I sat down with her when we decided to do this and said, realize something. We may take a personal hit on this. People may come back, and I even talked to my business partner, Peter Boboff, and said, look, you know, this may not be received well. So, right. and, and he was cool with it. And when I you first a lot told me about it, I didn't, I was like, wow, that's pretty bold. Like, you know, I've done some bold things in my day. That's bold. Yeah. But the reaction was just the opposite. Huh. It's been almost unanimously positive. And I thought, you know, we, we had, do get some comments, people saying, well, why are you helping these guys in prison? But when you run the numbers, the cost of incarceration is $50,000 a year. The recidivism rate is over 60%, you know, and no one is really approaching this directly. Everybody's sort of around the problem. And frankly, the system itself is not going to fix it. It's got to take private 
just like many problems that we have, it takes private enterprise to fix it. So we said, we're just going to do it head on and see what happens. And the results have been f- pretty phenomenal. Yeah. So we'll get to the results in a minute. I want to ask you a personal question. Yep. Because you emailed me about this a couple of years ago. Yep. And I haven't been dodging you, but I, I have been like wondering about it. Like, is this, should I do this or not? Or like, yep. gosh, and, and you've been very persistent with me. And I'm like, you know, I definitely want to talk to you about it. I, were you scared or nervous because most people have an impression of prison from yep. whether it's, I don't know, the Green Mile or yep. um, Oz or any prison film, yep. that this is dangerous and that you yourself might incur some danger working with hard inmates at a place like San Quentin. Were you personally uh, nervous, Chris? Yeah, I think the answer is yes to to some degree. Um, but, you know, San Quentin's a unique place because there's a lot of education and there are a lot of programs there, and I knew people that were there. Mm. So I just looked at that saying, well, you know, if they were there, then, you know, it seems okay. Obviously, it's a very ominous place. Um, San Quentin is death row, and, uh, you know... It is. Guys that are, yeah, de- uh, San Quentin has all the death row inmates for California. There's over 500 and some. Do we uh, have inmates. a death penalty in California? Has that occurred in a long time? Uh, it hasn't occurred in a long time. I yeah. think the last one was 2006, Tukey Williams out of San mm-hmm. Quentin. Um, but, you know, most of the guys are lifers in there, yeah. and uh, most are in for violent crimes. So I think the the part that was most difficult is to to be very straightforward and frank and sort of in their face, mm. you know, because I have to be. You know, this is a zero-tolerance program. Right. If they miss an assignment, they miss a class, or they have an infraction, they're out. And I've got to be the one to tell them that. And this is a sort of a life-changing opportunity. Um, so you've had to bounce people from the program? Yeah. Uh, we have about a 25% attrition rate. So, yeah, Ooh, I've got to make that's that. That's got to be a hell of a conversation. It is. It is. So, you know, have I you think... ever been scared for your personal safety? Like you ever, I mean, you obviously we all have this like vision of like, oh my God, you could go in there and get shanked or killed. I mean, that's the first thing I thought when you invited me. Yeah. And I listen, I'm, I'm a realist, but I, I'm just wondering like, my God, are you, you're pu- are you putting yourself in harm's way and, or not? Well, how do you reconcile <clears throat> that, Chris? You know, I think, um, now, uh, we, uh, we are actually doing a, an event at Stanford, and there was uh, Horatio, Horatio Hartz, who you saw the very end of, of or the beginning of his, his interview on, on, that, uh, on that documentary. Um, someone asked me that question from the audience, and I started to answer it, and Ray said, Chris, can I interrupt? He said, you have to realize that people like Chris and Beverly and those that are volunteers that come in, they are so critically important to our success that when we walk the yard, that guys in the yard know that they're, we have their back. And now we have, inside we have, I think it's 37 graduates that are still inside, and oh. a lot of them are sort of positive leaders in the prison. Hmm. So there is that there is that, there is that community, and there's yeah. that protection, but it's prison. You always have to be on guard. St. Quinn's sort of unique because we walk the yard and we have access based on our clearance to pretty much every, any place in the prison. So, you know, it is prison and you have to be aware of that. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I think now we, we have been around long enough. Pretty hmm. much everybody there knows who we are. And uh, so I think the safety is, is as long as you take the necessary precautions, I think you're good. All so right. I, I invite you back to come back. I'm going to come. I'm going to totally come. <laughs> right. um, I just always, you know, it's, I, I lived in L.A., so it's just, you know, like also being up here. But now I'm up here. There's no excuse. And I, too, drive by yep. San Quentin, and it's it's a stark reminder yep. of just how many people are in jail for the wrong reason. Some are in there for the right reason, but just how cruel and ineffective the system is at yep. actually helping people get through whatever caused them to do whatever bad deed they are accused of doing, if in fact they are guilty. In some cases, they're not. Right. It's The system is broken. So when we get back, I want to talk a little bit about has this actually had any efficacy? And if so, what has that efficacy been? Has anybody actually found a job or actually started a company because of the last mile, which, by the way, um, you can follow at TLM. Good, good Twitter handle, TLM. You. you must have some friends over there. Yep. Uh, for you follow that on Twitter and it's the last mile.org. Go check that out. Um, let me just take a moment to thank HipChat 
which is a communication tool that I use every day, all day, all weekend. And email, as we all know, is awful. You get put on these threads and these chains instead of the email wars that I am dealing with, uh, you know, I've been dealing with for 20 years. I now have a bunch of different chat rooms set up with all of my team members, external team members, fans of This Week in Startups, all kinds of different people. And uh, they just at mention me inside of there at Jason, hey, we're working on this project or do you have an answer for this? And in one-on-one chats, it really has let me uh, run virtual companies or companies from when I'm on the road. And it is an amazing solution. It's got searchable archives of conversations and decisions. And of course, you can integrate it with Jira, Jira GitHub. I'm like speaking like a Greek, Jira, it's Jira. Jira, <laughs> uh, Bitbucket. I just thought Euro, <laughs> like people say gyro. Um, and it's actually Euro. Um, and they also have native apps for Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, and Android, of course. And clients include Netflix, Dropbox, Salesforce, and of course here, us here at Launch and This Week in Startups and Inside. It's free forever for their regular service, which is pretty comprehensive. If you choose to, you can then get HipChat Plus, which has video and screen sharing, which I used the other day, and it's really good. That HipChat Plus is going to be free for the first six months for the first thousand listeners of This Week in Startups. Just go to hipchat.com slash twist. Hipchat.com slash twist. Thank you at HipChat on uh, the old Twitter for sponsoring independent media like This Week in Startups. With me today on the program, Chris Redlitz of The Last Mile and Transmedia Capital. You can follow Chris at Chris Redlitz, R-E-D-L-I-T-Z on the Twitter. Um, and... We're talking about the efficacy of the last mile. Mm -hmm. How many classes have you done? How many students? How many projects? And uh, for, for a lot of these people are in there for life. Hey, what's the point? What, what are, you, are you just easing suffering? Are they going to leave at some point in prison and start a startup? Explain to me what's happened since. Sure. Well, just to clarify, yeah. uh, a lifer doesn't mean that you don't have uh, the ability to get released. Yeah. Basically, a life sentence uh, with, uh, uh, you know, you can be sentenced to 15 to life, uh -huh. which means you have to serve a minimum of 15 years, and then you go through a, a parole board to basically present your your uh, ability to be reformed, mm. and they uh, go through a process, and they, they find you suitable or not, and that's really how it works. Uh, we've the last four guys in our program that have gone in front of the pro board have been found suitable. They're all lifers, and a big reason is because of the last mile. Because the pro board felt like they had taken the steps necessary to prepare themselves for a post-release uh, life and and become you know solid return citizens. Um, the program has been five years. We've had four entrepreneurship uh, classes. We end them all with demo days. We most recently had a graduation of the first computer programming curriculum in a U.S. prison, and they, they learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So that was a huge step forward for us. Of the 42 graduates we've had, uh, 10 are out working, uh, seven are in the Bay Area, and uh, three are in Southern California. And by the way, we're going to have uh, a graduate here yes. in the studio in about 10 minutes, so if yep. you're listening to the program, yep. we're going to have uh, Kenyatta on the program in uh, about 10 minutes. Yep. And Kenyatta is a, a great example, and we'll talk a little bit when he's here, but um, you know, he sort of epitomizes the success of the program. We're expanding. You know, we've had outreach from 14 different states. I was in New York last week meeting with uh, Governor Cuomo's office, and um, basically we're going to announce in July that we're going to be going into New York. Uh, we're expanding. By the way, you just announced it here on This Week in Startups. <laughs> Thank you for that there you announcement. Go. <laughs> um, you get a preview. Exactly. Um, we also have not officially announced, but uh, we'll do that as well. We received a grant from the California Department of Corrections to expand in California, and the next prison we're going to is Ironwood, which is about an hour east of Palm Springs. And the goal is to launch TLM and the coding uh, curriculum in four prisons. Uh, those will be our beachheads, and then we will reach out to the 33 prisons in California and pre-qualify guys that actually can be transferred into one of those four hubs. Mm. So that's really the... the so 42 plan. graduates. 42 graduates. And 10 of them are now working in the outside. That's right. Or what do you say, on the outside? Outside of the prison. Yes, that's right. Um, and we expect possibly f five or six within the next six months. Okay, very controversial topic yes. uh, is access to the internet yep. inside of prisons because there are 
entrepreneurial minds uh, that might do bad things, mm -hmm. getting messages in and out of prisons and whatnot. Yep. So how do you manage that? Are the inmates allowed to have internet access? Are you recording every screen? How, how do you even broach that topic with the warden? Right now we don't, uh, but we're working on it. So the, the coding curriculum was all uh, based on um, creating a curriculum that sort of simulated a live experience. Mm -hmm. So when you go in there and you see the guys coding, it looks like they're live. Mm -hmm. uh, we basically did it in flat files and downloaded a lot of libraries. So uh, we have an um, on-site remote server that serves as a repository of content, but they don't have live connections today. We do have a live feed into the classroom. So twice a week we get virtual instruction from San Francisco. Oh, and we great. did that also because we wanted to make sure that it was really scalable. Uh, we work with the guys at Hack Reactor. They, sure. they help develop the program. Many of their instructors are instructors in the class. It's very volunteer-centric. Um, so we do have connectivity, not to the local desktop yet. Hmm. But we really believe in the future that we will. We're working toward a joint venture, and we, we plan on having that later this year, where uh, we'll actually have an outsource capability for private businesses to outsource to the prison for web development. And, and in that case, we will have live connection. Wow. Yeah. Um, are prisoners allowed to use the Internet in any prison in America? No. What is your take on that? Is that humane? Is it fair? I mean, they have television, which is a medium, you know, uh, they have some access to television and books, yeah. but so much of what's happening in the world is on the internet. Is it fair? Is there a way to give them read-only access to the internet to at least be able to read what's going on in the world? So the, just to qualify, in federal prison, you do have moderated email. Um, so that's only in federal prison. But you... What does it mean, moderated? Well, read by somebody? That's right. Yeah, and you have to be uh, you have to be qualified to receive them. So I had a communication with someone who was a, a released from San Quentin who actually helped us initially start the last mile, um, but I had to be qualified to receive. So you have to sort of go through this clearance to receive email as well. But it's, they want to know who you are and that you're not gang related or something. Yeah, but they but they will read your email just like they read mail as well. Right. Um, but in state prison, that doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, I think it's part of what we've seen is that we have to educate the system, right? Mm. So there's this fear factor. And just as we, we went through the initial uh, TLM curriculum, one of the things we wanted to do was allow the guys to participate in social media. So we don't have connectivity, but we, what we did was they wrote out or typed out their answers. We have volunteers upload it. Mm -hmm. um, the, all the responses that are that people, whether it's on Quora or through the blog post, we print that out and bring it back so the guys can see the response. Wow. So they are sort of at arm's length participating in social media. That was a big hurdle to, to get over f as far as the administration went. Now they love it because the response has been so great. So again, we have to move in these incremental steps. We'll get there, whether it's, I can't say whether it's humane or not humane, um, you know, I think that it's, it would be an educational benefit, You obviously. can't say it, but I can. I mean, I can, thinking it through here logically, if the person is, because you, I think you have to maintain relationships with people, maybe you're being, um, you know, magnanimous or just, you know, trying to keep the dialogue open, but I, I think there is an argument that it is inhumane to not let somebody know what's going on in the world and to be able to develop as a human being. I mean, if you cripple somebody without having the skills of knowing what's going on in the real world. I mean, you're giving them HTML skills, incredible. But to not know and be able to read the newspaper and to understand what's going on in the world, I mean, that just closes you off to humanity. Well, it, it seems to me, I mean, I'm, listen, I'm not saying people should yeah. be able to play Hangry Birds or have apps or everything. And I, this is one of the things about incarceration is like every time we look at these individuals, I think we look at them and say we have to just be punitive in every yep. single way. Yep. Oh, my God, their food has to be disgusting. Oh, my God, their quarters have to be, you know, barren. And, and But doesn't that all of that punitive nature of the system and the punishment nature of the system, it, there are other places in the world where they are actually putting people, like I think in Norway or in some of the Scandinavian countries, they seem to have a way... Yep to get people through this without putting them in a cage right. and dehumanizing them and taking away any hope they have that their future might include some humanity. 
or it's just something brighter than being in a goddamn cage. Well, I, I agree. And, and we look at it as what are the most effective tools? Right. So we have the Internet. It's a huge tool right. that we're getting just this small inkling of access to there. And we're opening that access more and more. The, the, the ability for the guys to utilize those tools is really, it's phenomenal, the success we've had in the coding. You, know, you talk about guys who have never touched a computer who actually start learning JavaScript, and they're excelling phenomenally well. Uh, it's really exceeded our expectations. So, you know, I think that's, that's, the, that's the crime in all of it, that we don't have the ability to use all the tools to, to help rehabilitate. And, you know. Why isn't there a, I know there are like halfway houses or something where people go to when they leave prison. I'm, I don't, I'm not educated enough to know what that actually entails. But is there not an argument to say, hey, you're in this San Quentin and it, it, it feels like you go from, oh my God, this incredibly punitive system to they throw you out the door. That's right. And you're in the real world. Yes. Would it not make sense for there to be a building next to San Quentin that is called, you better appreciate your time in this building yes. because the doors on the other side of this building where you're supervised, you're allowed free access to the internet. Maybe you're in a room that isn't a prison yep. and you can be entrepreneurial and just, you could actually use the internet as a very good tool for that last six months or a year to actually see what choices people make. It's a great idea, and, you know, there's been discussion about things like that happening, but, you know, this is a legacy system and process and bureaucracy that's been around forever. So the stark reality is that most people come back to prison just because of that. You know, if you haven't, if you don't have support from relatives, what you're given is $200 and a bus ticket to anywhere, and that's it. So that's your support. And that's why it's so critically important for us not only to educate inside, but to, gr to really create this community. We have 10 guys, we want to have 20, we want to have hundreds that are really developing a, a network outs outside to really support because that is, that's why recidivism is so high. All right. When we get back from the uh, next commercial break, sponsor break, um, we're going to bring in one of your graduates, Kenyatta. And uh, Kenyatta spent 19 years in San Quentin. Um, it was then released after three strikes reform. Um, what, three strikes was reformed, um, and he was actually offered a job. Um, and we're going to hear all about that when we get back from this break. And uh, we can bring Kenyatta in, by the way. Uh, let me take a minute to thank Moo. Um, and they are an amazing service, Moo. I use it constantly. All of my founders and startups use it because they make beautiful, awesome um, luxurious business cards and um, all kinds of printable materials. And I have to say, one of the great ways to actually get people to use your product is to go out in the real world and hand out flyers and cards and business cards and offers. Bento is doing this. A bunch of other companies are doing it. It's working. Your app installs cost four, five, six dollars. Guess what? If you pay somebody 10 bucks an hour, 15 bucks an hour to go on the street and tell people about apps and hand out little cards, with a promotion offer, you can actually beat the rate that you're paying Facebook. And people were talking about this. We're going to a conference. What should we do? I said, why don't we get Moo cards? They're like, oh my God, that's a great idea. We'll get Moo cards with different photos in the back. And that's one of the great pieces of their technology too, is that you can actually split run and have different pictures on each card or uh, whatnot. And they do these mini cards. That's my favorite. But there are other beautiful triple thick Lux cards and letterpress, you know, like the fine, really old school stuff. And um, they have... Um, by the way, that, that tool where you can put different images on the back of each one is called Printfinity, um, and it just makes everything epic. That's exclusive to Moo. Their design templates are amazing, so you don't need to hire a designer, and you can just upload your own masterpiece if you like. Rich, thick, lovely. Uh, you can see and feel the difference, and you can visit Moo.com, and that's M-O-O.com. And I just love the fact that all of you are ordering Moo cards and then tweeting them back to me. If you order Moo cards and you take a picture, and you just CC at Jason, I will retweet you, you'll get more followers. Moo will feel good about themselves, and the show keeps going on, huh? That's entrepreneurship right there. That is. All right. Uh, let's bring Kenyatta in here. Uh, now, you met Kenyatta how long ago, Chris? Well, I met him of... when we first uh, were talking about doing the program, and uh, you know, as I said before, I had never been in a prison before, so how am I gonna select my class? So I had to depend on the prison administration to, to really, um, 
you know, recommend the guys. Huh. And then the name that kept, kept coming up was Kenyatta. Everybody said, Kenyatta, Kenyatta, Kenyatta. So I finally met Kenyatta. And uh, you know, you'll see in a second, he's a pretty dynamic guy. But um, he was one of the most positive, enthusiastic people I'd ever met. And here he was in San Quentin serving a life sentence with no possibility of, at the time of parole. Uh, and he's just beaming with enthusiasm, like, this guy, we definitely have to bring in the program, and uh, he, it's really worked out extremely well. He's been a beacon of hope. Kenyatta and I have gone around the country speaking to a variety of groups, universities, and so forth, and um, he's just an example of how things work. Kenyatta Liao. I'm pronouncing that correct. Liao? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, welcome to the program, Kenyatta. Thank you for having me. This prison system, explain to me what it's like to spend 19 years of your life in prison. I mean, how old are you now? You're 40? I'm 46. I'll be 47 in a couple so months. So you are born 68 or something? Yes. Okay, so we're the same age. Mm -hmm. Except the last 19 years I've been out, you've been in, a, in San Quentin. Right, San That's Quentin among, amongst other prisons, yeah. yeah. What is that like, can I ask you? Uh, well, it's very eye-opening, that's for sure. Um, prison is a really harsh environment. It'll snap you, uh, you know, into line really, really quick, help you understand what's really important, and uh, that's what it did for me. You, you seem so well-spoken and at peace and calm. Um, were you always this way? I don't think so. Yeah? <laughs> no. Um, what were you like when you were younger? Well, I mean, well, here's a great photo, by the way. You look like an M&A fighter. Can we pull the photo up? <laughs> Will you this, can we pull this photo up or no on my computer? Uh, you were diesel. Was that after you were in prison and pumping iron every day? or is that, that was before? probably about mm, two years into my life sentence. I was about 27 years old there. So you got a life sentence for two robberies and then carrying a firearm. Yeah. Actually, it was, it was one robbery that took place, but I was convicted of two counts of robbery for that one robbery. And those two counts of robbery turned into two strikes when the law came out. So you didn't, did you hurt somebody or kill somebody? Well, I didn't kill anyone, uh. but I did create victims. Bottom line, I did hurt somebody. I hurt people um, by holding a, a pistol to them. I oh, mean, wow. that, that, you know, emotionally, okay. when you think about the damage okay. that, that does to somebody. Yeah. But a life sentence seems like a pretty amazing, <laughs> I mean, that's a life sentence. It's a big deal. Yeah. But you didn't murder anybody, kill anybody, rape anybody. True. None of those things. Correct. Just you rob somebody at gunpoint, and then you had another gun. Right. Yeah. It's, it seems excessive, but... Um, it's the law, though. It is the law. And this three, three strikes thing, Chris, is... Was this the thing that Reagan kind of put in place, that, like, we're going to be tough on criminals and just... Just if they step out of line in any way, it's, it's game over. That's right. It was 1994, and uh, there was sort of this hysteria of, you know, there's a, there was several serial killings that had happened. Uh, Polly Klaus was one of those. And it sort of uh, created this um, groundswell of uh, fear. And uh, it was part of sort of hard on crime. And, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, there was a big, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, there was a, a big increase in incarceration during that period of time. And three strikes was a big part of that. Yeah. Um, so you spend 19 years in jail. How, how do you reconcile losing 19 years of your life? Have you reconciled it? Can you ever reconcile losing two decades? I don't look at it as losing. Okay. I actually look at it as finding, That's fascinating. finding really? something, finding myself, finding, okay. you know, rebuilding my personal brand and actually being able to, you know, leverage, you know, the things that I've learned inside, you know, for those 19 years and actually apply it to help other people today. So I don't see it as losing anything. To, you are unique in this fashion, I think. Many other people who are there who you met are slightly more bitter and angry about losing a decade or two. Well, I, I, that's probably true. There are yeah. probably guys there that, that feel that way, but yeah. I don't look at myself as an exception at all. Huh. I mean... 20 years ago when the judge sentenced me to 25 to life in prison, I wasn't an exception then. Right. So I don't see how I can be an exception now. When that happened, how old were you when you got sentenced? 25. In that moment when you were being sentenced, 
did you understand the gravity of it, or were you just too young to understand what was happening to you, I wonder? Yeah, I was in deep denial about what was going on. I was blaming everyone else for the situation that I was in. It was the judge's fault, it was the law, it was the, my crime partner who snitched on me, it was all these other things. And uh, it took me a while, probably about five years, to really come to grips and accept responsibility for the role that I played in getting myself into prison. You know, and um, with that realization that I was the problem also came this idea that I'm the solution. Mm. And that if I got myself into this, I could do something different and create a different result for myself. So how did you hear about the last mile? And what was the first moment you realized this could have a positive impact? You remember where you were? Were you working? Were you in the yard working out? Were you in the kitchen? What were you doing? Actually, I was um, serving some food at a banquet for the San Quentin Trust. And Chris and Beverly were invited as um, to to attend the uh, to attend, to attend the banquet, and um, I met Chris and Beverly, and immediately when I, you know, talked to them about, you know, and they presented me with the idea of the last mile. It was something that I wanted to be a part of. Hmm. I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I just used it in the wrong way. So, you know, the prospect of being able to be part of something that could help me guide that in the right direction, I was all in. It does seem like crime requires when you're thinking of doing a crime, a lot of ingenuity and trying to figure out how am I gonna get away with this crime? What crime could I do to get money? And I, and I bring this up, not that we have in any way, you know, any similar experience, but when I was a kid, we, we would commit petty crime in Brooklyn a lot. I stole hundreds of dollars worth of stuff as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, comic books, ice cream sandwiches, whatever we could yeah. break into a deli or, you know, go in and steal comic books or whatever it is. And we, I was fascinated with how do you construct a crime and not get caught? Um, and I think there is something, is there something to that as an entrepreneur? When you meet like a lot of the criminals in there, do they have this like cleverness? Is that, is that right? Did you feel you had like a cleverness to your crime and how to like execute it? Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of thought that goes in planning, that goes into uh, committing a crime, the same way that there's a lot of thought and planning that goes into, um, you know, starting a business. Uh, so I think those are definitely transferable skills. You know, what the last mile is really doing is tapping into that, the guys inside and soon the women inside who have that entrepreneurial spirit and tr figuring out a way to help guide that in the right direction so that they don't ever commit crimes again. They There's can a, use that skill set to, yeah. you know, to be successful. There's a lot of guys who are running entrepreneurial pursuits in prison you, you may have run into. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the unique entrepreneurial pursuits in prison that you've seen that have impressed you? Um, probably the most impressive thing that I've seen is artwork. I've seen some of oh, the most really? fantastic artists that you've ever seen on the inside. Guys that, um, what they can do with a... Uh, you know, the kind of pencils that you use at the golf course to mark out on your score? Yeah. Guys will use pencils exactly like that to draw some of the most fantastic drawings you've ever seen. So, yeah, I think really? the hard work. Yeah. And do they try to go then sell those or like? Yep. And they make a living doing that? Yep. Uh, amazing. Yeah, it happens all the time. Really? Um, do you feel the prison system is... Um, because we have this recidivism rate of just obscene proportions... Is it, did you get better at becoming a criminal when you first got in there as a young person? Did you learn how to, you know, because that is everybody's perception. You go to prison, just trains people to be better criminals and be worse people. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I imagine it is in some instances, but yeah. for myself, going to prison scared the hell out of me. It didn't yeah. want to make me continue down the path. It wanted to make me change so that I could be a better person. You I were scared. Absolutely. I'm looking at a picture of you. You look like you're about 250 pounds and six foot four. How big are you? About 245, six five. But at okay. the time, yeah, in that picture. But I was that picture. What it, the mask that I have on my face really, yeah. you know, what it's trying to hide is this fear that was inside of me. I was scared as hell right there. Didn't know what my future held. I had right. 25 to life, and in California, 25 to life means 25 to life. So I didn't know if I was ever going to get out. I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to, you know, have kids, have a you know, get married. Why didn't, didn't, why didn't you give up? Uh, you know, like, I think for me, I probably would have given up. Like, I don't know if I could have this positivity. Where does this positivity come from? This relentlessness. Did you, de you developed it inside? Well, it comes from hope. Yeah. I think all of us have hope on some level. Right. And for me, it was just, I never wanted to give up hope. 
I never wanted to continue to live my life in there. And mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that really, really helped me change was thinking about the legacy that I would leave behind. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be remembered as a thief or a criminal or a convict or a prisoner. I wanted to do something different that my right. family could be proud of. And so I just started making some real fundamental changes and choices in the way, you know, that I live my life. And your family must be so proud of you now that you're out. Yeah, they yeah. are. They definitely are. Who's the most proud? Oh, my mom, by far. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> definitely. You're, I I was you're, just going to say, I had, to, I, get, I had the opportunity to sit next to his mom during the resentencing. And it was one of the most extraordinary moments in my life. What, what is that? Like a, you're in a little room with... No, like, no, no. You're in a courtroom. Oh, you went to a courtroom to be resentenced. Well, on top of that, uh, Judge Mano, who actually sentenced Kenyatta 19 years before, was the presiding judge on his resentencing. So that Did was... Did he remember you? Did oh, yeah. yeah Absolutely. Remember. So I, I actually, after the resentencing, I asked to go back in his chambers and talk to him. And he yeah. said, because you, know, you have this feeling like judges are police officers, whatever, are kind of callous to it. He said, I remember that and I regretted it, but there's nothing I could do about it because the law said I had to give him a life sentence. Um, These judges never bought into this like crazy, we have to keep no. people in jail forever. I don't think so. No. No, I don't think so. But he did say, he said, you know, I mentioned before about all the social media, and he said, you know, was, Kenyatta was very prolific in social media, had a lot of, matter of fact, he won the um, the uh, the award the Quora Answer of the Year Award at the Shorty Awards I think it was uh, 2013. Yeah. What was the question, Kenyatta? What does answering? the first day of a five plus year prison sentence feel like? Oh my God! Answer that for me right now. <laughs> what is that like when they? So take me to the day. What day was it when you came in? Was it a Monday, a Tuesday? Do you remember? It was September 25th. I remember that two days before my birthday, and uh, it was the worst day of my life. Um, what happens? Yeah. This? Take me through the process. You get there on a bus or something? Yeah, so they come and wake you up. I was in the county jail at the time. I'd okay. already been sentenced, and so I'm just waiting for what we call to catch the chain. And basically, it's a bus that takes you to prison and from the county jail to prison. This is like the movies. like Exactly. And, and you had chained. that in your mind, like the movies, right? Yeah, I had been through that one other time. Yeah. And so, you know, I kind of knew what that felt like. But right. this time, it was with a life sentence. And I was at the reception center at R.J. Donovan in San Diego. And the bus, once we got on the bus, the bus ride actually took me straight through a part of San Diego that I grew up in. And so oh, I was looking at, yeah, I was looking at streets, I was looking at stores, I was looking at places that I grew up around and thinking to myself, wow, this could be the very last time that I ever see Isn't any 96 of 96 and 95? Something yeah, like that, yeah, 95. 95. Yeah. God, I remember 1995. I was 24 years old, 25 <laughs> years old. So it was a very surreal experience and it's something that I'll never forget. What time forget. did you get there? I got there probably about mm, about noon. So they drove all the way up from San Diego to San Quentin? No, not to San Quentin. We drove from R.J. Uh, Donovan in San Diego to oh. um, Ironwood State Prison, which oh, was Ironwood, yeah, yeah. out in the desert. And so all this takes place like really early in the morning. They wake you up about 3.30 in the morning, 4 in the morning, and why put you they, on a bus. Why they and they up that early just to fuck with you? Oh, sorry. I don't know. Did they just try to do that? Do they, do, they, do they try to like mess with you, like the guards? and just? Absolutely. It's all about fear and control. So they're just trying to intimidate you from day one because they want to break you and not have to deal with you. Absolutely. What do they do to break you? What they oh, do? I mean, verbal abuse, physical really? abuse. Um, yeah. You can't do anything. You can't fight back. You yeah. got to take it. Inside prison, you don't have, really have a voice. And so, you know, I'm not saying that all the guards are like that, but there are some of that stuff that takes place yeah, inside prison. So you get there to their, you get there at noon. Yeah, we get there in the afternoon, and, you know, it's, it's like, like I said, it's a very surreal experience. It, it takes a while to settle in that this is going to be your home for the rest of your life. And that's something that, you know, that is a really daunting idea, and it's something that loomed always at the forefront of my thoughts. Huh. And I never wanted to spend the rest of my life in prison. So I knew that. That's when, when I, it kind of hits you, right? Exactly. And when I got there, I knew that I wasn't there just to get out. Mm. I was there for a reason, to learn a lesson, yep. to change my life, and fortunately I was able to do that. Yeah, and so you have the guards who are looking to break you, Yep. and then I suppose those inmates who are there yep. are looking at you saying, fresh meat, we got to break this guy too. Yeah, well, there are a lot of people there who have those kind of ideas, yeah. people that want to try to, you know, prey on the next man or, you know, to try to do him harm. And then there's also other people in there who've been there for a while who've changed their life change their lives and change their ways and want to help. Really? You know, some, of my, some of my greatest mentors are still sitting inside San Quentin right now. Hmm. 
what did you learn in the program? What were some of the skills you learned? and what, what, um, How have they been applicable now that you're out? Yeah, through the last mile, I think probably the most important thing that I learned through the last mile was how to leverage technology in a way that's going to benefit me right now. Right. Um, prior to the last mile, I didn't know the first thing about Gmail or email or any of that, and or social media for that matter. Huh. But um, last mile introduced me to these concepts and these ideas, and you know, it kind of took away the fear, so that when I was actually able to use this stuff, it made it a lot easier. You, when you went to jail, they were barely mobile phones. Right. You remember mobile phones? I oh, guess. yeah, the phones were like this big. They were like yeah. that big in 95. Yeah. Exactly. And were you aware of the Internet and the iPhone? Like people talk about these kind of things in prison, and you see them on TV, I guess, once in a while? Yeah, I mean, we have, we're able to have phone calls and visits and these right. kind of things, and so we were definitely aware of how technology had progressed since, you know, I, I was aware of how technology had progressed since I had, you know, been incarcerated. And so I, I asked questions, I read up on stuff. and But you never touched a smartphone or iPhone or iPad in prison? No. Or a computer? No. Not that was connected to the internet, no. Yeah. So you're kind of like in this time capsule, like... Yeah. That's got to be surreal when you're watching TV and they're using these futuristic devices. Yep. And you're like, what's that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard for, for a person who's on the inside to really grasp how this stuff works and, and what you can do with it. I mean, I really never knew, you know, how big of an impact that technology was making on the world until I got out and actually got a smartphone in my hand. And then people ask me all the time, you know, what was the, you know, the biggest difference that you've seen? And, you know, for me, it was how quickly we can access information now. I mean, we live in this, you know, inf information, you know, we live in the information age right now and data yeah. is king. You know, and so when I got the phone in my hand, I was able to just, you know, find out statistics about my favorite football team or recipes or directions here or there. It just like, it blew me away. Yeah, you were like, I don't have to go to the library to exactly. get this information. Exactly. Or the newspaper. Yeah. That's kind of mind-blowing. Hey, take me back to that uh, sentencing moment. That seemed like what a magical, amazing, again, back to that surreal word, like, moment. Like, you're so you're in the chambers, and you haven't seen that judge in 19 years, or did you see him in between? He actually wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wasn't there at the hearing. You didn't get to go to the hearing? I Actually, I probably could have, but uh, it was easier for my attorneys to, to fast-track the whole situation for me not to be you. there. So, so your mom's there? My mom was there. My, uh, a bunch of my other family members were there. Chris was there. Uh, um, and so they make your case, and yeah. you're in a cell somewhere. I was still in San Quentin. Just wondering, my God. At this very moment, my fate is being debated yep. in front of my mom. Well, it was one of those things, too, where the... the but you the, were there, Chris. I was there, but the, the, it wasn't as cut and dry as you think because there was not a stipulation in, in the three strikes reform about gun possession. So was it a violent or was it a non-violent uh, act? So that was the argument. Uh, and so the guys from Stanford did a phenomenal job uh, in representing Kenyatta, and they found him... Um, you know, suitable for release, and they resentenced him. But it was kind of touch and go. Huh. So you weren't sure if you were going to get out? No. Right. Wow, man. And so what happens? You get a phone call that they say, hey, Kenyatta, you got a phone call, and you got to then walk to the phone and find out? Or does yeah. the guard tell you you're out? No, I had to go to the phone and make a phone call, and I found out that, you know, that the ruling went in my favor. And then whoa, whoa, slow down, slow down, slow down. I got to know yeah. about this moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is incredible to me. You, yeah. the, they say it's your phone time, or you say, hey, can I use the phone? Yeah, I signed up for a phone call, so it was my phone time. It was your phone time. Right. You walk over there, and you, whose number are you dialing? Chris's, your mom's? I, I dial my mom's number. You dial yeah. your mom's mobile number. Yeah, my home, her home number. Her home, yeah. home number. The mm -hmm. phone rings. She yeah. picks it up in a ring or two? Or yeah. One ring? Yep. And what, she just starts crying or something? She, she accepted my collect call. And well, I hope she says she's she, <laughs> she, she immediately started crying, and I knew it was oh. good. I already knew it was good. You knew it in your I, heart? I, in my heart, I knew it was good. Yeah. I didn't know when exactly I was going to get out, but I hmm. always knew from the very beginning that my day was going to come when my number got called. Hmm. I wanted to be ready. Yeah. So you're at Demo Day. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys from Rocket Space is there. Rocket Space is a great co-working space here in San Francisco. I've done yep. many live shows out of their space. And they got a new space now that's really big and dope, I heard, yep. somewhere. I don't know that's where right. it is. 180 Sansom. Yeah. And so they got hundreds of desks there, tons of entrepreneurs. And the CEO of Rocket Space came to the last mile. That's right. Friend of yours, Chris? Yes. Who? Yep. Who is this? Duncan Logan. So Duncan Logan, <clears throat> how do you know him? 
Uh, I knew him when he first started Rocket Space. Matter of fact, when he had his first location, we brought the first 12 companies in uh, to reside there. So I knew him for a long time, and he had actually come in to several sessions prior to demo day just to see what we were doing and get a feel for it. And that's really what we do with you know, prospective employers who want to give internships to our guys. I invite them in. I want them mm. to see what the process is. Mm. Uh, but then he saw Kenyatta at Demo Day, and he literally came up to me after Demo Day uh, was over, the, still the same day, and said, would it be okay if I offered Kenyatta a job? I don't know if and when he's going to get out, but if he ever does, I want that guy working for me. Wow. Yeah. So you go back to Kenyatta and tell him, what, what, how did you find out that you had a job offer, Kenyatta? <laughs> Chris came and told me at, uh, at our next session that Duncan had offered me a job, and that just blew me away. I mean, can you imagine? being in prison with a life sentence and having a successful businessman come into the prison and offer you a job. It's crazy. You don't even, don't even know when you're coming home. Yeah. I mean, I was already working hard to change my life, but hearing those words made me dig 10 times deeper and reach 10 times further for my goals. And it was about a year later that, that he got out. What a mitzvah, man. Yeah. I'm not even Jewish, I can tell you that's <laughs> That is unbelievable. Why was he so impressed with you, Kenyatta? What was it? I really don't know. I think he just saw how hard I was working and, mm. and really, you know, connected with that. And Duncan is a, he has a great eye for talent. I mean, he's, you know, selected everybody that's working at Rocket Space. If right you do now. say so Have yourself, he has a pretty good eye for talent. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, this guy's a smart guy. <laughs> no, Duncan is an awesome guy. The Rocket Space team is a, is a great team, and, and I'm so blessed to be there. So okay. he, started, he started as an intern. Uh, now he's been promoted several times. The 46-year-old intern. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Um, the life for a 46-year-old intern. There's a movie. They're going to make a movie about you, Kenyatta. <laughs> well, well, you are making a movie. Let me tell you. I <laughs> what? Mean, I, I, when I first started Rocket Space, even before I got there, I had this this idea in my mind that I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to help this company grow and to be successful. If i got to scrape gum off the floor, if i got to show up early, leave late, d- dump course, the trash, make course. coffee, do whatever it takes. you you got a reboot. you got the chance to start over. Right. He did, and now he's been promoted. He's now a manager of campus services, and two of our other graduates work for him. So it's pretty cool. I mean, so now done. two of the graduates work for you. Yeah, they work with me. Yes. So you're the boss now. I'm not the boss. You're He's the boss. boss. Two people and we're, we're, we're a team. We're a team. Yeah. Okay, but you're responsible for the team's behavior and right. making sure that they get everything done. So it's a little your boss or something. That's pretty impressive, dude. Well, thank you. T- take me to that moment, that last day when you get to walk out of that godforsaken place known as San Quentin. That was probably, I can't even put that feeling into words, how that felt. I tell Chris, and I've told a bunch of other people, that I would love to just be able to take that feeling and put it in a cup and let, pass it around let everybody take a swig so they can understand how good it feels. That's a pretty good description, by the yeah. way, Kenyatta. Thanks. It's like the, it's so amazing. The joy you felt getting out of there is that you just want everybody to experience it once in their life. Yep. So we asked him what he wanted. I think we, uh, the first thing was... Uh, Mexican food. So we went ahead and had Mexican oh, food. I love Mexican food. What'd you get? A quesadilla? You get a chimichanga? What'd you get? I got some tacos. And a burrito. Yeah. And a, yeah, you got a taco, burrito. Yeah. Food sucks in San Quentin. I'm assuming food is terrible. It's horrible. Yeah, it's really bad. I don't ever want to see another top ramen as long as I live. Let me put it like that. Really? That was a staple well, in my diet a for about 19 years. Top ramen? So you have to eat ramen every day in the prison. You know. Yeah, I was blessed to eat ramen while yeah. I was there. Huh. Um, I just, I don't want it today. What, what, what do you think of our society, and my own thoughts, that puts people in prison and tries to break them and tries to punish them in every way possible, from food to accommodation to free time, to how they're treated by the inmates. What, what do you think this says about us, our society, since you lived it for 19 years? The rest of us, it's very easy for us to sit out here in the free world and say, yeah, oh, this guy put a gun in somebody's face, fuck him, whatever, you know. Who, who cares if he sees TV, if he eats ramen, this guy put a gun in somebody's face. Mm-hmm. But what does it mean for our society that we try to we tried to break you for all these years and tried to punish you and tried to just make every chance we could make you feel like less of a human being in that process. This is the experience, is it not? It is. Uh, it makes me really think long and hard about, you know, us as a society, what we can do, what we can do better. Huh. Um, you know, punishment, that's one thing. You know, that's, 
what the prison system really revolves around and what it's been revolved around for a long time, but we can do better than that. And I think that 50 years, 100 years from now, you know, we'll be able to look back and say, you know what, prison was a, it's a thing of the past. Mm. You know, it's something that, you know, the same way that we used to ride around in horses and buggies and that kind of thing, we'll look back and say, wow, how do we ever even do that? You yeah. know, and so there, there are better ways to, to go about, um, you know, reforming people and changing people besides just punishing them. And I think that's what we're demonstrating with the last mile. So what would you change about the system? I mean, you met some bad dudes in there. Yeah. You met people who needed to be punished or needed to be, I don't know, contained from society. You agree or? I definitely met people who, even myself, I mean, I'll be the first to admit I needed to go to prison. I needed to learn a lesson. Um, in prison, I was fortunate enough to be able to learn that lesson. And I think that if people are given, you know, more opportunities to educate themselves and really figure out what they're mm. passionate about and, you know, if the system took more time to meet people where they're at mm. and address the real core issues, you know, why people actually go to prison, why people actually make the choice that they make, besides just, you know, throwing them in a cell, I think that we can make a did we can make huge strides. Did anybody even try to understand why <clears throat> you did what you did? Was there like a psychologist or some counselor who was like, hey, why did you do all this? And what's our plan to get you out? Do they provide those kind of services? No, those kind of services are not available from the state. But uh, there are a number of programs on the inside um, that are volunteer-based, well, mm. pr primarily at San Quentin, mm. not at other prisons, but uh, that, you know, actually look into those kind of causative factors, you mm. know, what lead people to prison and what help people understand What would you change about that. it? I mean, and how long did you need to go away, you think, in your mind? Like, was there a year where you said, like, okay, I get it. I, I know what I did, and I know what I need to do. Like, what year did that happen, or what month or week? You know, I thought about that, that and yeah. looking back, you know, I needed every single day that I was there. I really did. I feel like, you know, it you happened. needed 19 years. It happened exactly the way it was supposed to happen for me. You're a pretty you know? philosophical guy. Well, in prison, you got a lot of time to think <laughs> and get philosophical, you know, about stuff like that. But um, I I did exactly the amount of time that I was supposed to do. I learned exactly the lessons that I needed to learn, and that's why I'm sitting here with you today. Man, I have to say, I, I am so impressed by you, Kenyatta. I understand why he offered you the job because – to see your resolve and resiliency is what I, I angel, you don't know me, but I'm an angel investor. Mm -hmm. I invest in companies and I look in people's eyes and I can make a decision pretty quickly if this person has what it takes to actually succeed. And it's really about resolve and resiliency. My God, when I just look in your eyes, I can see your resolve and your resiliency. And I don't know if you had that before you went in or after or where you went wrong, but my God, like you have it. You have that thing where I can tell that you would like not give up an opportunity or not give up on something. I think you're going to have tremendous success in this life. I think the 19 years, it sucks. But my God, I think it's going to be a great, like, I hope you live to 100 because I think you're going to kick ass. I think you'll be running rocket space. <laughs> You've got CEO material, I think. Thank you so much. I'm not, I really I'm not appreciate exaggerating that. that. I can tell, Chris. When I look at somebody, I see their resolve. And Chris, my God, everything you've done up until this point means nothing. It, what really matters is what you've done with the last mile. Being a marauding venture capitalist and making a ton of money and living up Marin and all this stuff, like on a professional basis, what you've done here is just so outrageous. What would you like to say to Chris in terms of like creating this program for you? Uh, he already knows. <laughs> I, well, I want to hear it. I well, want to hear it. The audience he, wants to hear it. What does this person? What does this man mean to you? And and you know, how has he impacted your life? Tell him. Man, I love this guy. I do. I'd give him the shirt off my back in a second. Wouldn't even think twice about it. And I'm all in for the program, I'm the same way that I know he's all in, not just for me, but for everybody in this program. Yeah. And so I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I really do. Wow. This is just, like, amazing. I really, you know, like, Chris, it's very easy for people to give up and, like, to, to even approach this. I don't know if you heard the interview earlier, Kenyatta, but I was just thinking, my God, I'm such a coward. Like, I would be very concerned about, like, I don't know, my own personal safety, going into a prison, and, like, maybe there's other people I could help in the world. Like, why would I start with prisoners and inmates? And you chose to do this. It really is a fascinating... I'm fascinated, Chris, by that you took this choice. This is a choice that nobody else, or so very few people would take. Well, I, you know, look, you, you sit here in Silicon Valley with me, and, and we talk about addressing the biggest opportunities. Yeah. So, you know, it's the same mindset. I mean, to me, it wasn't a big stretch. To many people, it was. To me, it was like, this is a big friggin' problem. And I have maybe some tools that can help. 
And I had no idea it would explode positively the way it has. I mean, I had no idea that it would become this national phenomena that it has, has become. You know, we've done this documentary, and there's, you know, every news service has covered it, and we're, you know, have all this, this incoming, in, you know, interest. I, we had no idea. When Beverly and I started this, we just said, could we make, could we change one life? Right. Could we change one Kenyatta or help one Kenyatta? Well, you saved a couple dozen already. Yeah, but. Well, you helped a couple dozen. We have. And saved a couple. Well, I mean, all the guys, I, I tell you what, even the guys inside in Kenyatta will, will uh, definitely acknowledge this, that the culture in San Quentin is changing. The guys mm. that are still inside, we're, we're basically building a network inside a community inside that is really powerful. I mean, the, the, the last mile community inside is really po powerful. How um, many uh, inmates are there? There's 4,200 in San Quentin. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a uh, newspaper that's published out of San Quentin that goes to all the prisons. So everybody in every prison sees this, and they write about the last mile, and it's really spread. We get emails every day from family members, from corrections. It doesn't need to be just technology, just the ability to open up a pizzeria or it's, we just took, we function took, in this new technological era that's right. that you so many people skipped a decade or two. I mean, That's right. We, we don't focus specifically on technology, although... When we ask them to build their business plans, we want them to include a technology component and a social cause. So mm -hmm. every one of their pitches includes that. Mm -hmm. And it may be a mobile app. Kenyatta developed something um, called uh, Coach Potato, which well, was a what mobile was that? app. Oh, can you tell me what was Coach Potato? <laughs> How'd you come up with the idea and what is it? Well, I just love football. And basically, it's just a live interactive coaching experience. Who's your team? Oakland Raiders. Okay. Yeah, I know I'm in Frisco right now, but still the Raiders. <laughs> okay. Um, but basically, gives football fans an opportunity to uh, to select plays for their team while they're watching the game live from their ah. smartphone or mobile device. Very cool. Yeah. So you can pick what play you would have wanted them to do. Right. Then, I guess you can see what percentage people. All yeah. Well, if you them. choose, the, if you select the right play, then you earn points, level up in ranking, and you can win prizes. That's a great idea. It's a really cool idea. Yeah, now if we get some gambling in there, that's a really <laughs> good idea. See, I'm into gambling. Yeah, um, they're exactly. gonna, I think they're going to change that regulation. What, what percentage of people in jail were, um, d you know, there in something that was drug-related? Do you have any idea? I'm not sure, but yeah. I would say at least 50% huh. in some way. Yeah. Whether it's drug-related, where they were high when they committed the crime, right. or they were, you know, their crimes revolved around drugs somehow. I'd say at least half. Was yours involved in drugs in any way, or...? It was in the sense that I was I was getting high. I was smoking pot every day. Yeah, you were smoking pot every day. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I was about to say. Sorry about two thirds of my friends. <laughs> How crazy is it that pot is now legal? Yeah. You went to jail. Mm -hmm. People were going to jail for marijuana, and now as a society, we finally realized, oh my God. Right. Who cares? That's right. Like, and in fact, like around this neighborhood, like. I wish we, I mean, the biggest solution to the problem around this area would be to give out free marijuana yep. because everybody's on meth. Yep. And that makes you nuts. Yep. A lot of exactly. people doing drugs in prison. Is that true or not? I want to ask a couple questions about what's true or not in prison because we all have these perceptions. Well, um, is there drugs in prison or not? Like, there are drugs in prison, yes. And are the guards dealing them or how do they get in there? I've never seen a guard dealing drugs, right. but I'm sure it happens, though. So. Yeah, so guards can get them in there somehow or somebody gets them in somehow. It can happen, yeah. Is it hard drugs? Are people doing like heroin and stuff like that? Or just smoking weed? What, 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 what drugs are in there? Same drugs that are on the street or the, or the same drugs that get introduced into prison through contraband, oh, illegal really? contraband. Yeah. And how do people pay for the drugs in prison? They do it all different kinds of ways. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, cash money. There's, oh, really? you know, people who on the street who do transfers and whatnot. But ah, stuff so you happens. do the transfer outside. Yeah. No, I think bit, if, no if, Bitcoin, though. If, no, no. But <laughs> no, bit, no Bitcoin yet. yet but, Not yet. Yeah. Not yet? Yeah. But I think, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. And people are always trying to figure out ways. People that have that entrepreneurial spirit that we talked about yeah. are trying to figure out ways. And I think that that's something, you know, that I don't think a lot of people really think about. Right. Is it that parallel between the convict and the entrepreneur? You know, the convict and the entrepreneur both are trying to build this minimum viable product somehow. For sure. And people on the inside, that's, you know, they're trying to make the very best of what they have. Or trying to build things. They're exactly. hacking it. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I always told people when I was a kid, thank God I had a good teacher who, like, got me to stop doing bad stuff in Brooklyn where I grew up and, like, I would, I told people, I was like, I, I have a Lex Luthor mind. I'm constantly thinking about how to beat the system. In our world, beating the system, you get rewarded. 
And I think, you know, like when you look at drugs, like people beating the system with drugs and stuff like that, they get put in jail for a life. It's, it's, it's ridiculous that yep. anybody's in jail for drug offenses. We have pharmaceutical companies out there selling drugs and then people getting prescriptions. I mean, the, the, how do you feel about the disparity in how justice in this country is delivered? We got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. It's a magnanimous way to put it. Yeah. I think that we can do so much better. And I'm hopeful that, uh, that we will get to that point. You know, we heighten people's awareness of, you know, that there are alternatives to what's happening right now. What's happening right now is not sustainable. Yeah. Fiscally, I mean, you think about it. Morally, there's no way that we can continue doing what we do today. Locking people up for 25 life or stealing a, you know, a bottle of baby formula or something like that. I mean, yeah. there's, there's got to be a better way. So yeah. I'm hopeful that we will get to that point. I can tell you that if we're putting white people away for taking, like, Valium and Prozac and whatever else, you know, like, people are, like, taking recreational, we would solve this problem real quick. Yeah. I think it's really easy for the people in power to be like, well, it's a bunch of black guys and whatever, Hispanics, like, it's not a big deal to them. I really think this is, like, one of the biggest tragedies in our society today is that we're doling out justice in such an unfair manner. We have to stop the... We have to stop this incarceration. We really have to reconsider the people in prison who are in prison for, like, marijuana offenses. If we're going to change the law, can't we have to go backwards and? I agree, and it's uh, you reassess. Know, we a lot of uh, a lot of the guys. I would say most of the guys that we come across in in, in our program have really uh, incredibly poor up- upbringing, single parents. Um, you know, drug relations, uh, that type of thing. You know, Ray Hart's had over a nine-year period, he had seven people in his family killed. You know, he carried a weapon and ended up killing somebody, you know, and was, was incarcerated for that. You know, Darnell Hill is another guy who was committing crimes with his dad, and he was arrested with his dad, and he, served, he was serving a life sentence, and he and his dad were cellmates in San Quentin. Wow. So, yeah, it's like that type of, of orientation. Two million people, Chris? 2.3 million, yeah. 2.3 million in a country of 300 million. We're, we're almost at 1%. Well, as I said before we started, you know, we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population in the U.S. It's madness. It's crazy. It's this all ha- Let me ask you this question. Talk about entrepreneurship. A lot of these prisons now are for profit. Is there something going on where the, there is some backdoor, we're putting people in prison because it's profitable? And these are there lobbyists getting more people in prison? Do you think, Chris? Uh, you know, that's Listen. that's happening. It's not happening in California necessarily, okay. but it's it's definitely happening. Um, you know, we we really believe that you know we we built prisons uh, to just put people away in, uh-huh. during that sort of hysterical time. I think mm-hmm. people have shown a lot more uh, sensibility. You know, a good case is Prop 36 was voted by the, you know, the voters. Because Prop what was that? Explain what that was. Uh, that was reforming three strikes, uh, which allowed Kenyatta to be free. I mean, let's think about it today. If it wasn't for Prop 36, Kenyatta would still be behind bars. Can you imagine a guy like this still being incarcerated? It, mm. That's a crime in itself. And then recently, Prop 47 was um, sort of uh, allowing judges to uh, make a determination between felonies and, and uh, misdemeanors. So it, give, it gave judges more flexibility there. So, and that was also voted by, you know, in by the California voters. So it's showing there's a sentiment to change. And I think that's going to resonate nationally. And, that, and hopefully we're not going to build more prisons. We won't have private prisons because that's, to me, it's ridiculous. That's um, the thing to me is like, I, I hate to be a conspiracy theorist, but when I see these like for-profit prisons, to me, that just seems like, wait a second, that's a, that's just should not be allowed. We have for-profit prisons and then we've got prisoners and inmates working for 10 bucks a day, right? You got paid something to work inside the prison or no? Yeah, I got paid... I think it was like 26 cents an hour. I mean, that's, how is that possible, Chris? I mean, people are getting paid. Well, uh, yeah, it's um, what we're trying to do just to, there, there is a situation where, you know, if you, if you have a prison job, you, I think, prevailing rage is somewhere between 25 and 35 cents an hour. But I'll, What's I'll, the legacy of that? What's the history of that? Uh, I'm not sure, actually, where that yeah. was originally, um, you know, <clears throat> Uh, determined, but um, in our coding curriculum, we actually partnered with the Prison Industry Authority, and they do all the joint ventures uh, in California. 
uh, this is a job for the guys. So they get yeah. paid 37 cents an hour, but it's a 40 hour a week job where they're learning. Um, so they're basically learning a curriculum that someone on the outside would have to pay for. Mm. So yes, it's a job and they're getting paid. A yeah, no, wage. listen, you got to get it done. However you have to yeah. get it done. I'm just saying just in the big picture, mm -hmm. what if you paid people the market rate or whatever, and then just put that against the expense of them being in prison? Well, you can if you have a joint venture. So uh, in a prison, in a state-related job like in Yada Head, it's 25 to 35 cents an hour. In a joint venture where we're going to be employing these guys, um, they, get, they have to be paid a market rate. So we're, Fantastic. De we're determining right now what that is. It's probably going to be fifteen to twenty dollars an hour. As Whatever a, it is, as it's ten bucks an hour. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that so. And then where does the money go? Does the money go to pay for their incarceration, or does yeah. it go to pay for they get it when they come out? How does that work? Yeah, it's a third to the prison, a third to restitution, and a third they get to keep. Seems pretty fair to me. How can you? Well, I can guarantee you, there's going to be guys and gals lined up on the inside to be part of this. Um, being able to have a job on the inside is huge. Being Why is that to, huge? Well, I mean, it gives you a sense of purpose. Yeah. You know? Um, for sure. When you're on the inside, being able to work, being able to get up every single day, it actually gives you some, you know, a sense of purpose. And when, you, when you're actually part of something, building something, and at the end of the day you're able to see, you know, what your hard work can do, these are transferable skills that people learn on the inside that can carry over on the outside. Yeah. And so what Prison Industry Authority is doing today, I firmly believe is super helpful in helping people, yeah. you know, get a leg up on, you know, when they get out. I of, think this could also, Chris, um, I think that this could be a bridge to getting the more hardcore members of our society to maybe soften up a little bit on an economic basis. Because every time we have economic problems in this country, mm -hmm. you know, things come up for discussion sure. like, yeah. oh, should we be able to play online poker or gambling? Every time there's a financial crisis, like five states allow gambling, five more. Sure. Or marijuana, and like, oh, you can get some tax dollars, pays for some schools, great, yep. fills in some potholes. Yep. If we could say, hey, listen, it's costing $50,000 to incarcerate people, and they can make $15 an hour, and five of it goes back, and hey, every week we're deferring X cost, 20%, 30% right. of the cost of them being in prison, they're paying to be in prison. For those hardcore people, they may actually like that concept of like, hey, you're in prison, and you're paying some portion of your way. Well, this could be a great bridge. On top of that, the recidivism rate for PIA graduates, prison industry authority graduates, is 7%. So it's, it's wow. basically 54% lower for those that have graduated. Is that because of selection, like you can't get the job unless you're keeping it together? Well, partly, yes, yeah. but, but also it's, it, it, it doesn't matter anyway. It trains them yeah. skills. Like, yeah. you know, they can actually go out and get jobs as plumbers and and, uh, you know, factory workers and furniture, uh, you know, workers, and those are jobs that they have inside. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really transferable jobs. So the, the numbers speak for themselves, really. All right, Chris, let me ask you a hard question. Yeah. And Kenyatta, talking to you too. What happens if one of the last mile inmates makes a mistake? You help them get out. They start working at Rocket Space. One of the two guys you're working with on your team decides, hey, I'm going to boost something from Rocket Space or whatever. They get picked up for something. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do to the program? You know, it's uh, it would be disappointing. It's not going to ruin the program. Um, you know, we're we're looking for a perfect record out of San Quentin and our out of our state prisons. But you know, if it happens, it happens. Uh, we're doing everything we can to you know to make sure that they have a good landing pad. But you know, it could we, happen. It could happen for sure. It could happen. It hasn't happened. You know, out of uh, graduates of San Quentin, but it certainly could. Do you guys talk about that, you and your two uh, fellow graduates? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we, have, each other, yeah. we have you know, an unspoken like, rule amongst us that crime is not an option. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just not. And so you know, if you need money, if you need help, if you need anything, you know, that's what we're here to do. The support system starts on the inside and it carries over to the outside. And we're here for, for one another all day, every day. And crime just could never be an option for us. And so, you know, this is something that we take super serious. It's, it's an oath that we take from the very beginning to, to uphold the standards in, of our program. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's just what it is. It's just a way of life for us now. And they, they, they actually, Kenyatta said, we actually have them sign an oath. So this is an oath of commitment inside and outside. So it, it becomes a brotherhood. So we I do think it's wise that you have this brotherhood and yeah, you hold we do each talk other about to a standard that. because if one of you Fs up yeah. and it, it just reflects on everybody, it could, really, right. it could damage your ability to expand the program. That's right. 
it's really important, right? Yeah. So All of us go through challenges. All yeah. of us do every single do. day. And yeah. so, you know, having that support around you is just super important. Mm. You know, so as we continue to build this empowered, connected community, that's what we're trying to do is, is continue to grow that sense of support and community amongst us. This has been very powerful. Let me ask you a couple more questions about, like, yeah. being in jail since you, you were totally open to it. Mm -hmm. And I think people in the audience probably, like, enjoy this discussion a little bit to just get this insight and understand what's going on there. Like, do you have to, like, punch the first guy in the face when you get into that yard? <laughs> like, that's another one of those misconceptions. Like, guy like me goes in. I'm 5'9 on a good day. <laughs> I would get destroyed. I, I wouldn't last a day. What would happen to me in there? I, I have to punch the first guy. If I walk in and I, like... I got to walk up to you and punch you in the face and get in a fight with you to get my respect. What happens? Bob Mines, you just don't let anybody push you around. Period. So the second somebody comes up and starts something, you got to just be able to throw down. Somebody, if somebody tries to test you or you know um, disrespects you, then you have to do what you got to do. And people, really? Yeah. That is the truth, huh? That's the truth. That's the truth about prison. Yep. What would happen to me? How would it make it? <laughs> You'd probably be running the prison. <laughs> Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. I see that in your eyes. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, hmm. You'd be what they call a shot caller on the Oh, inside. really? They call that shot caller? Yeah. You'd shot have caller. the keys to the car. I got. I would probably speak talk to the guards into setting up some sort of protection for me. I'd probably talk to you. I'd be like, hey, Kenyatta, we've got to get something going on here. Listen, you got to be the muscle. We have mm -hmm. a couple of ideas of how we could like run some numbers in here. I think Maybe you got it going, going, yeah. Going. We could get a little poker game going. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, Listen, Kenyatta, man, congratulations on getting it all together and, and staying positive. You know, that must be hard. And I think, uh, Chris, you know, man, just huge respect for you. Thanks. You know, we know each other in the business, you know, yeah. just like sort of casually. And, you know, I, we see so many people in this business do so well. And then nobody really ever, you know, maybe when they pass on, they decide they're going to give their money away, whatever. But, like, you're actually taking time to do something important in the world. It's, yeah. like, really commendable. Thanks. Um, and Kenyatta, man, phew. How long you been out? Uh, it'll be two years, uh, two years, July 3rd. God. What do you love about being out? What is like, so so you, did the, you did the Mexican food. Yeah. What was the next meal? What was like next on your list? You must have 10 things on your list. Can you go, I mean, aside from meeting a nice lady, I'm assuming, it would have been a nice thing. <laughs> yeah. So like, home-cooked meal. Bar really? Barbecue, barbecue ribs. Oh, so you Macaroni and cheese, yes. My down in San Diego, she's yeah. down there? My she, mom my What mom was that was like there. coming home? Oh, that was fantastic. Just being able to be with my family, my nieces, my nephews, oh all my, my God, relatives, my friends. You had all these people friends. you got never to spend any yeah. time with. Yeah, it was really, it was tough being away from them for so many years, but to finally be home again, in, best in feeling Diego, in the world. In San Diego. Yeah. I, got a, I, I got some benefit. His aunt basically said, you have ribs for life. Ribs for life's pretty good. For me. Yeah. So, wow. You got to stay in your old house or your mom's still in the same house or it's a different house? Moved into different places. My mom yeah. lives in Arizona now, but uh, yeah. my aunt still lives in the same place. And so that's where I had the ribs at. That's yeah. where all the family Going was home at. there, like that yeah. must have been a crazy feeling. It was fantastic. And you Never got to see your old it. friends. Yep. The good ones. You're probably around with some bad guys. I've too. seen some of the old bad ones too. And guess what? You know, they it's got funny kids because and jobs. <laughs> kids, jobs, these same guys that used to be Mr. Badass on the street, yep. our family man. You know, one of my best friends, an eighth grade school teacher now. Yeah. You know, three kids of his own. So. Wife's call him on the phone, like, get your ass home. You got to take these kids home. You take these kids out on a Saturday. Yep. Yeah, that's what catches up with you. Do you uh, so, uh, what's going on? Are you going to start a family, you think? One day. I Are hope. Thinking to. about it? Yeah. How do people look at you at Rocket Space? People like ever look, you, you get the sense people look at you on the side of their eye and like, oh, that guy's a convict. Mm. You feel like maybe some people are nervous around you? That could be the case, but I haven't experienced that. Everybody yeah. at Rocket Space, both on the Rocket Space team and the, the members there at Rocket Space, have been really super supportive of huh. myself and Caleb and Floyd. The three of us are last huh. mile graduates that work at Rocket Space. And they've just, you know, given us a tremendous amount of support. That's and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great place to be. I'm really, he has a really lot thankful of respect. to be there. I, I'm going to speak out. He has a lot of respect at Rocket Space. He's the man. At, I call him the mayor of Rocket Space. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people really, really like him. He works his ass off, and, and people respect that. So, I, you know, there's very few people, if any, that are looking out the side of their eye right now. Yeah. See, that's the thing is I think you're lucky to be in San Francisco. I grew up in New York, and I lived in L.A., like, in these other towns, like, I think people are a little less forgiving and a little more harsh. This town is just so open to different people and supporting yeah. different people. That's it's right. it's a little weird as a New Yorker, frankly. Like, I came to San Francisco, and I'm like, everybody's so cool with everybody. I'm like, 
You're really cool with all the naked people over there in Santa Claus outfits? Because yeah. I'm kind of not cool with that, I think. But well, I, think I guess was... I'll have to get used to naked Santas running around <laughs> on Santa Claus Day. But, you know. Well, that was the ideal. I mean, really, this is the place that we should have started it, right? Because yeah. pe people are so uh, willing to uh, give people a second chance, right? Yeah. And the outpouring of... of participation from people that have volunteered. This past year, we had 90 volunteers. Um, we have companies that are reaching out to us to employ. I mean, it's one of those things where it's really, uh, it's been so shocking to us, but yet it does reflect this community. So mm -hmm. this is the ideal place to start. Here's, here's what you gotta do. You gotta be like, hey, uh, yeah, you know, I've been thinking, what's the guy, Duncan is the guy over yeah. there? You know, hey, Duncan, you know, I really have enjoyed my time here, but I was talking to Chris and I was thinking maybe I could raise a round in my own co-working space and so, <laughs> I was wondering, do you think you might want to invest in something like that? And then Doug would be like, listen, I can't afford to lose you. I'm going to open another space. You can be GM of the new space. Kind of, you know, like, start, you know, maybe well, raising around. <laughs> well, we have the domain already. What is it? It's called geekcons.com. Geekcons.com. <laughs> Very cool. So. Yeah. You'd be, I think you'll be running a rocket space, too. And that's, that's pretty tight. We'll see. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we, you know, we've talked about a lot is, you know, Kenyatta really wants to be... Um, in a leadership role in, in the last mile, and that's really what we're gearing ah, toward. That'd so, be great. Yeah. That would be full circle for you. Yeah. yeah. And if we could, gosh, you know, as a society, you know, back to the big picture, like, we got to, like, just intervene when kids are younger, you know, when they make that first, second, third mistake. I mean, when you, the first time you were arrested, I'm assuming that there were, like, a dozen times somebody could have intervened in your life and helped you to not to avoid that, right? Yeah, the first time I was arrested, I was 22 years old. The first time I was arrested, I went straight to prison. There was yeah. no probation. There was no, wow. you know, no counsel, no, no slap on the wrist, you. any of that. I got arrested. I went straight to prison. Shh. And so, um, yeah, I think that what you said about, you know, moving way upstream and really intervening in kids' lives, you know, when they're young and trying to help them figure out what they're passionate about when they're young yeah. and get them on this trajectory of success when they're young is super important. Hey, watch a scared, did you ever watch a scared straight show? Yeah. yeah. I was like watching that and I was like, I don't know that you, I mean, listen, yeah, it's great for them to realize how serious this is going to be when they get in prison, but, like, maybe we can find out what's going on at home with these kids that, you know, they're 10 years old, they're 12 years old, and they're boosting stuff. Like, maybe something's going on at home that's not right. Like, maybe we can get these kids into a foster home, or maybe yep. they need to, like, have a better teacher or a mentor. Like, are we really taking them to the prison to just scare the bejesus out? They had that program when you were in there, the Scare Straight program? They have a couple um, programs for kids at San Quentin. Um where they bring kids in who have made bad choices and they have some of the guys here that work with them and talk to them and it's they're really great programs. They, yeah, they scare the shit out of them. Yeah, yeah we have they, a guy, uh, I was just going to say, James Houston, who was in Kenyatta's <clears throat> class, uh, was one of the guys, it's called Squires, where they bring guys or kids in prison. Now he's out, works in Richmond, and he's a senior peace officer. Um, he's not a, a policeman, but they no. send him out in the street every day and he, and he talks to at-risk youth. Love it. What we're discussing with Richmond is how we can bring a consolidated, sort of a condensed format of our coding curriculum uh, to them to work in their facilities. So you are gonna go to the preemptive side? We are, and, yeah. yeah, and That's James genius. is the first one that, uh, that we're really gonna go to. He All has right. that street credibility that would attract the guys to come in. So Mexican, ribs, what else did you really wanna do when you got out? Did you want to go in the ocean or something? Did you want to, like, see a did movie? That. You did the ocean thing? I'm not <laughs> a big movie guy, but what I really wanted to do was get in the car and drive. You know? Really? Go for a drive, yeah. That's and I've sweet. been able to do that quite a bit. Get behind the wheel? Oh, Maybe yeah. a little bit drive? Yep. You got a favorite car? Because a lot of cool cars out there. You've been in a Tesla. <laughs> he definitely has a favorite car. Yeah. And what is it? Uh, Nissan GTR. That's my favorite car. Oh, the, oh, the Godzilla. Oh, yeah. Godzilla is amazing. Yep. That thing is like, I've seen a couple of those because I lived in L.A. for a while, and mm -hmm. all the Korean guys had them in K-Town. They would, like, yep. line them up. GTR, what's that, 0 to 60 in, like, 3.4 seconds, 3.2, yeah. something crazy? Super fast. Great car. Twin turbo, V6. Unbelievable. I think Rocket Space maybe gives you a raise. You get that GTR. You have a GTR? You have one? No, I got a Hyundai. You got a Hyundai? That's it. <laughs> yeah. You build up. A Hyundai is, like, 30 dimes, and the GTR is, like, I think it's only, like, 70, right? But you got to like, start somewhere. I think it's yeah. 70 dimes. It's not that expensive. No. I had the Corvette, the C6 convertible. Beautiful car. Oof, incredible. And now the new one. Ooh. But the, G, the good about the GTR is that can corner. The Corvette's good in the line. Yeah. GTR. You got to drive an electric car. That's got to get into Tesla. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> it's. Yeah. That is. Now you see that new one can go like 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds. It's a sedan. It's incredible. All this new stuff in the world.
Anything that's new that just blow your mind? What blew your mind, like on a technology basis? Something like you got when you first touch it, you're like, that can't be real. Well, I think one of the biggest. Have you seen the new lightsabers? <clears throat> No, I have. We don't have lightsabers. Okay. We don't have lightsabers. <laughs> I think those, I think those what, aren't real. <laughs> what, what really what really got me was um, I had my PC open at my aunt's house one day, and um, when I was in San Diego just visiting, yeah. and my little niece she's only she was only five years old at the time. I had my laptop open, and she walked up and she says, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I'm doing some work." And she went to touch the screen, and it was an old PC, and she couldn't <laughs> she couldn't she couldn't you know, swipe exactly, and her she face screwed up, and it really made me, you know, it, that really hit me. Yeah. How far advanced that kids are these days, you know, with technology. I didn't even know how the heck to touch, you know, to use a touch screen. And here she is, you know, five yeah. years old doing they, that. They so. can't imagine a world without touch screens. There's a great video on the internet on YouTube of like a little kid, like a toddler, who goes and she's like looking at a magazine. Yeah. And she starts pinching the photo mm -hmm. to try to open it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, oh no, that's that's paper. Yeah. Paper doesn't expand like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Kenyatta, I'm so happy for you. Um, and I wish you great success. And what a great, uh, you know, what a great story. Thank you for sharing and being so honest and um, bringing Thank us you into your me. world. Yeah. And Chris, man, you know, my hat's off to you. Honestly, like, I meet a lot of great people in this world. I meet a lot of people, period. And uh, this is, you're one of the finest people I've met for doing this. This is beyond, you know, like, people can build great big companies. People can invest you know, people can get lucky and invest in a unicorn. To do what you're doing is like a thousand unicorns. Each person who graduates a unicorn, who you can turn around and let them become productive members of society. And man, if you if you make this scale, if this can go, you know, every year to a couple more prisons, can you imagine what that'll do? How can we help? People who are listening, there's a lot of people listening to the show, probably want to help. How can they help? I'm going to be a mentor for sure. Okay. But how can everybody else help? Well, we're at that point. We're expanding. So we, we have a curriculum we know works both on the coding side and the entrepreneurship side. So now we're, we're uh, raising funds. So we've got – my goal this year is to raise a million dollars. We're about halfway there. Is it a for-profit, B corporation? What no, no, it? no. This is a nonprofit. A nonprofit. Yeah, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and uh, so really, you know, we're, we're funding a lot of the expansion. Uh, Beverly and I self-funded it for the first three years, and um, so now we're growing it, hiring uh, more, you know, dedicated employees, hmm. and so that's really the goal is to expand it. So you know, uh, we're how much do you need a week, or how much do you need a month to run the program? Well, what's the you know, budget? What's the budget need to be? Yeah, again, it, we break it down to individual. So uh, it's about thirty-five hundred, between thirty-five hundred and five thousand dollars a year per per student. Um, that's fully fully loaded, okay. uh, so it's not that crazy of an expense. I mean, when you think about spending fifty thousand a year just to house, you know, an extra three to five thousand dollars is not that much. What we're going to be doing, uh, we were actually, I'll do another announcement here for you too. I love it. Um, we are going to be launching a sponsorship program. It's basically a uh, a charter sponsorship program for smaller companies. You know, we've had. Uh, grants from LinkedIn and Adobe, and we've had in-kind. You have uh, had that. Huh? Yes. Uh, and we've also gotten some sponsorship from Microsoft. But we want to allow smaller companies to participate. So we're basically going to be doing a seat sponsorship, $5,000 $5, a seat, um, that the company can be a, a charter sponsor. We're going to do 20 of those initially. And, uh, you know, that's something we were initially uh, going to announce in, in June. But, um, you know, we really want companies that are in the valley to participate, um, to come in if they want to see what's going on, to help mentor, but also to help, you know, fund the expansion. And when these guys get out, just like Kenyatta, they are phenomenal employees. And, you know, we want to continue to perpetuate that. So that's really the mission we're on right now. So that's how people can help. All right. So it's $3,500 a year. That's right. Per per inmate. That's right. And you got about a dozen now, or per class. What do you do per year? Uh, in do coding, we're doing we're doing twenty four per class. We'll do ah. cl two classes there, so we're going to be forty eight per class. We'll probably do multiple classes in San Quentin next year, uh, and then in uh, in the entrepreneurship class, it's between fifteen and twenty per class. Um, so we'll do multiple classes there, so we can start graduating hundreds of guys uh, pretty soon. So about three hundred a month. Two fifty a month, something like that. Two fifty a month, exactly. Again, depending on how many, Three, how many, how many prisons we're in. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm going to back one student a year. I'm going to put thirty five hundred down. Awesome. And then I'm going to ask my listeners to match me, 
and uh, we'll set up like some sort of page to collect it. Maybe we'll use recurrency or something. But if uh, you're a fan of the show, I'll tweet it out later. Maybe everybody can match me. I'll, I'll pay for one student for the year, and then we get everybody else to match. We get two we, students in, and then that's a start. We do have a donate page today. Oh, great. Um, but Where we, is that? It, it's on thelastmile.org. Great. Um, but we got to we, do a Kickstarter. we got to get like a little something going like, hey, let's get the class of sure. this, you know, yep. like so people can feel like there's a sense of urgency yep. or like recurrency does this pretty Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Good, good, I'm an investor in that company. It's a good platform. Um, for doing this kind of thing, but I like to I like to have uh, you know my team tier two will participate. That'd but be great. It's a uh, I think what you're doing is tremendous. It's just tremendous. You. And Kenyatta, good luck. Thank you. Uh, man, your mom must be so happy. With you. <laughs> yeah, she is. I keep thinking about your mom. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to show her this. <laughs> She's gonna be like, wow, it's got it's got it together. Yeah. Got it. To it took him a little while, but he got it together, man. You better late than never. For sure, you know, and that's the thing is like. You have to think about like what can you do with the time you're given, yep. right? Like, we're all given a certain amount of time on the planet. Like, you got this time now. You got like a really good opportunity. It's so great. Yeah, something that I used to, an affirmation that I used to carry with me every day on the inside is just to do my very best where I am with what I have, no matter where I am, you know. And mm -hmm. so I carry that with me all the time. Yeah, do the best you can with what you got. Yep. Yeah, where you are. Where you are, man. Nineteen years. And you stay so positive. So really, it's a good example for the rest of us. Um, I know I know a lot of people who didn't do 19 years, and they're miserable. <laughs> I do, too. I know a lot of people who are rich and miserable. I know people with private jets who are miserable. I'm not pointing any of you specifically out. But I, like, I literally know some people who are like not happy, and they, and they have every reason to be. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got every reason to be bitter, you know, and like you're, you're actually happy and at peace. So it's a big deal. All right. Listen, thanks, everybody. This has been a great episode. Everybody uh, go follow at TLM. You can follow Chris Redlitz, uh, as it sounds, R-E-D-L-I-T-Z. Um, are you, are you, you have a social media account? What's your social media? I'll blow you up. Are you allowed <laughs> to put your Twitter out there or no? Uh, I'm not on Twitter you know, oh. at the moment. Are you allowed to be or no? Oh, I'm definitely allowed to be. You're I just, allowed to uh, be on everything. You're out. You're yeah, clear. Yeah. But I'm, Is it like terms of your probation that like they limit you to anything? or? No, I'm not on probation or parole or anything. You're just free and clear. Yeah, I was released. So released. I was you can just I was do released. what you want to do. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Can't get a gun, though. Don't want a gun. Don't want a gun. Don't need a gun. Don't need a gun. You can't. But even if you wanted to legally get one, you can't get one, right? Because you're a free felon. Correct. Can you get like a medical marijuana license or no? You're not allowed to. I haven't looked into that, but yeah. that's yeah, that's not an option either. Let me tell you something. Something that's changed a lot since you were in prison is What's weed. <laughs> they have been for the last 19, you missed this, for the last 20 years, they've been taking the strains of marijuana mm -hmm. and making them insane. So if anybody offers you any weed, just be careful because it's going to be about 30 times more powerful than the weed from 1995. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculously more powerful. Yeah, I'll take your word on that. Yeah. See, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks again to our sponsors, Moo, and uh, who else is a sponsor? Oh, Hip Chat. Yeah, you said every day. Thank you, Hip Chat. Thank you, Moo. Thank you, Jackie, for setting it all up. And Jacob for on the ones and twos and making sure everything's good. Uh, everybody go support thelastmile.org and follow them at TLM. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.